Okay. There we go. Right. Okay, so it's nice to meet everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your Monday. Um, I am a pediatric neurologist. I should have mentioned also, I do see both kids and adults, so I try to deal with ADHD across the spectrum. What I'm going to do is kind of give you a talk that has different aspects of the biology of ADHD, but it's not anything that you're going to need to take a test on or anything crazy. It's not biology class. Um, putting in the most fun and interesting bits so that hopefully everyone can, um, you know, uh, take home something that they will retain. So let me just share my screen. And yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll deal with them at the end. But I have a lot to talk about. So I'm just going to get moving there. Hang on one second, um, because there we go. This is what I want to do. And I want to go to slideshow. Okay, so, um, you know, what we're talking about is how to win with ADHD and how understanding the biology of ADHD helps people understand how to do their best with it. So I truly believe that ADHDers are winners in every way, and but they may need some help in and coaching in how to get there. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about what ADHD is because I I want to make sure amidst all the noise from the YouTube and the TikTok and the doctors and the this and the that, that we're all on the same page. Um, to understand focus, you have to understand, or to understand ADHD, you have to understand what focus is. Focus means that out of all the different things you could be paying attention to, your brain picks one thing over all the others. So I don't know if you've ever seen sheepdog trials. They are amazing. That black and white dog there in the background who's herding the sheep, my God, will stay there and be only thinking about the sheep no matter what else goes on around him. And then there's my dogs. So um, we have, uh, you know, a dog, the brown and white one up at the top cannot walk in a straight line because every little thing catches his attention. That guy is distracted. That's when we start talking about a lack of focus. Um, then we have the other brown dog that is impulsive, just kind of does things without thinking them through. Here's the main point, which is that in a normal brain, you focus sometimes and you're not focused sometimes. That's true of every single person on this call. That's true of everyone with ADHD, but that's true of all working brains. Everyone focuses sometimes and everyone's not focused sometimes. A good analogy is that in focus, it's like having one thing on your desktop and everything else is put away in the drawers, right? So that way you kind of out of all the different things that are in the room, you've got one thing on your desk, everything else is put away. That's what focus in your brain is like. Then there are people who have a lack of focus where things keep hopping on the desk. You've got the elephant, the flowers, the this, the that, everything goes on, goes off. Everything is at the same level. Everything is equally important to your brain. So your brain goes from one thing to the other thing to the other thing. How does your brain know what to pay attention to? And they're all at the same level. So with ADHD, the key is that, you know, an ADHDer's brain works like everybody else's brain. Sometimes you're focused, sometimes you're not focused. There's a switch in your head, which I will talk about in a, in a few minutes, that shifts from focus to not focus to back and forth. And the same things shift you. So everyone focuses better when it, they're interested in something, when they decide to do something. Everyone has a harder time focusing when they are hangry, when they are tired, when they're like, I hate my boss, I hate my teacher, I don't see the point. But the thing what ADHD is, is when that gets unbalanced, when you are unfocused way too much of the time. So everyone focuses sometimes, everyone's not focused sometimes. ADHD means your brain tends to be unfocused way too much of the time. And what I always ask my patients and often get an 
blank look on is who cares if you're focused? You know, you're a nice person. You mean well. What does it matter if you're focused? And here's why it matters. And by the way, everyone always says the same things. My teachers want me to be focused. My parents want me to be focused. My wife wants me to be focused. But it's really important for everyone to know why you want to be focused because you're the most important person. The thing is that when you have just one thing on that mental desktop, your brain can put all its energy towards that one thing. And then what happens is the thing gets done. And everyone is focused on the thing. Is the homework done? Is the honey-do list done? Is whatever the spreadsheet done? But you know what? The thing isn't the important part of it. The thing that's important is how does doing that thing make you feel? So when you can focus, you have a harder ch or you have an easier chance of getting something done. You have success, but it's the satisfaction, the yay, I did it. That's the part that sticks with you. You do not remember what you got on your test on October 12th of, you know, 1997, you might remember years later how it feels to be able to go and take a test and do well on it. So it's the happiness that's associated with the finishing of things that makes the difference. And when you are happy over and over again, you become more hopeful about your ability to set goals. You become hopeful and then you start working harder because you believe you can do it. And you know what? When you work harder and you're focused, then you have bigger successes. Then you have more happiness and more hopefulness. And guess what? Now we're rolling. You work and do harder and harder things. You're building self-esteem. So what I try to point out to people is that focus is not to do with the actual tasks, but how the tasks make you feel. It's a direct path to happiness. On the other hand, if your brain is crowded with all these different things all at the same level, it's very anxiety provoking. And your brain is sort of being pulled in lots of different directions. You don't finish any task, even though you're not at rest, you're not taking a little vacation, you are feeling pretty anxious and you've been meaning to do all these things. What happens then is because you don't get the task done, that leads to a bad feeling. And that bad feeling is the opposite of self-esteem. It makes you feel like you can't do something and it makes it harder to be hopeful and set goals. And then, you know what? You have more problems with focus and then you have more bad feelings and on and on in the opposite direction. So this kind of negative feedback cycle is really important to recognize. When you have bad focus, you have more anxiety and depression. When you have more anxiety and depression, you have bad focus. A lot of times, the different symptoms of these things can mimic and worsen each other. Sometimes it's hard as a doctor to figure out what to address first. Do we address the focus and hope the anxiety and depression gets better? Or do we address anxiety and depression and hope the focus gets better? I'm just going to spend about 10 seconds here talking about how ADHD is different from a learning disability technically, although many times people are throwing these, these terms together in part because of how schools form a, uh, 504 and IEP problems. But technically, a learning disability is a problem with a specific skill of the brain. So specifically for reading, specifically for writing, specifically for math. ADHD is more global. By definition, it has to affect you in multiple areas of your life, not just in one area. Diagnosing ADHD is challenging. You know, unlike a broken bone, you can't just send someone to x-ray and go, wow, there it is. There is no like MRI signature. There's no clear EEG signature. Even if you send somebody for neuropsych testing, which in our area costs somewhere around five to $8,000, 
those aren't very good either. They're, I mean, they're, they can be helpful, but they're not perfect. Um, like all neuropsych conditions, it's a list of symptoms and how we define those symptoms evolve over time. I think it will be easier to be more definitive in the future about how we're going to diagnose it. But right now, we don't have a whole lot. So the list of symptoms is based on iterations of how ADHD was first defined in the first place. So this is something that started to be talked about in the late 1800s with hyperactivity and has evolved over time to the most recent DSM diagnosis in um, 2013. I think we're due for another one soon. However, the point is that ADHD was first thought of as basically bad kids with bad parents. And all the iterations are sort of starting with that as the stem. Um, so the interesting thing about the history of ADHD is that up until very recently, ADHD was defined as still only in children until about 1994 when very grudgingly, um, some language was introduced into the DSM, which is our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the basic agreement of how to diagnose psychiatric disorders. Um, and the other thing that is something I'll point out is that up until about um, 1994, there still was a difference in ADD versus ADHD. And then after that, there was no more ADD. Everything was called ADHD. Um, I'm going to mentioned that ADHD is very genetic. So if one family member has it, many, many other family members are more likely to have it too. That means if you're a child, your parents likely to have it. If you're a parent, your child is likely to have it. Brothers and sisters are likely to have it. Um, the, we don't understand the genes as well as we would like to, although that kind of understanding I anticipate will get better and better over the next decade or two. We do know that some of the genes code for dopamine transporters and receptors and other proteins in the brain. This is kind of um, like you look at it and you might go cross-eyed with this, but the, the point is not to kind of memorize every little bit of it, but the point is that ADHD involves a lot of your brain. It involves the front part, it involves the side part, it involves the middle part. This part, oh, I can't, I don't think you're seeing me, but it involves the middle part of your brain too. And different parts do different things. So the hyperactivity part of it is, for example, the teal area involving the motor cortex and you know, there's other aspects that might be more involved with executive functioning or remembering things, but a lot of your brain is involved. Interestingly, there's an area in your brain that is yellow here in the picture that talks about or deals with emotionally detaching from things. You cannot be able, you cannot focus well um, unless you're able to be emotionally somewhat detached. And I'll get into that in just a second. The genes determine the anatomy of the brain and they determine some of the chemicals of the brain too. Again, the idea behind this slide is just to show you that the chemicals involved in ADHD, which are primarily dopamine and norepinephrine, which are basic signaling models and molecules in the brain, they are found all over the place. Like many people will come to me and say, you know, the problem is that I have too little dopamine in my brain and I just need more. That is not the problem. Dopamine is a very, very complicated neurotransmitter. It's found in many areas of your brain, not just in ADHD, not just in the reward system, but also, you know, Parkinson's is a dopamine disorder. Breastfeeding involves dopamine. So it's, it's a complicated chemical. It's all over your brain. Norepinephrine is an alertness molecule. And again, it's expressed in many areas of the brain. 
Um, the theory behind dopamine and ADHD is not really as simple as too little dopamine, as I've said before. The theory is this, that, you know, dopamine makes you feel rewarded and good. Cocaine releases dopamine and blocks the reuptake. Basically, if you have cocaine, you're, re you're, you're lighting your brain on fire with dopamine. Um, uh, too little dopamine at the synapses does happen in ADHD and why is that a problem? It's because it's a problem because you may not feel good with regular activities. You may always be looking for something new or big to release that dopamine to feel good. It may also be that because your baseline dopamine in certain areas of your brain is less plentiful, when you get a dopamine hit, it might feel extra good. So extra things, ex exciting things that release dopamine are more attractive to you. You kind of gravitate to those. There's other layers to this. Since there are fewer natural releases of dopamine, it's possible that people with ADHD may also have fewer dopamine receptors, and that may decrease motivation. So because you're getting fewer feelings of reward or feelings of good for doing tasks. So it may take more exciting or personally relevant tasks to get the dopamine hit. Um, so basically, the ADHD brains can both overreact and underreact to dopamine and can lead to risky behavior. So the risky behavior stimulates you to look for the dopamine receptors and then or sorry, it stimulates you to look for the extra dopamine hit. And that dopamine hit makes people feel good. You survive those risky behaviors because you're also increasing your attention for them with the dopamine and norepinephrine. We don't know if this is right. This is the theory. We don't know what happens over time because we do know that receptors change over time in your brain or they can change over time in your brain. The amount of dopamine you release could change over time too. And we don't have a good understanding about how dopamine interacts with serotonin or other neurotransmitters. So this is a really complicated thing. It's not simple. I am gonna give you a very simple diagram of sort of communication between two brain cells with dopamine so that you get an idea of this. Basically, brain cell one, neuro, neuron one, releases dopamine to neuron two, that's the blue arrows on the left side. And neuron two then acts on those dopamine signals that it's getting. The drugs for ADHD block the reuptake, meaning that after dopamine is released, it sits there, it stimulates neuron two, and then there's a cleanup process where neuron one takes out, it takes back the extra dopamine in the brain or in the synapse here. What the blood, what the drugs do is they block neuron one from uptaking the extra dopamine in the synapses. Basically what that does is it makes more of the dopamine available between neuron one and neuro, neuro, neuron two. So it's kind of stimulating neuron two a little extra. So that's how a lot of the drugs work and that's how dopamine can uh, communicates between brain cells. I'm going to shift a little bit um, to talk about the combination or the the I don't know the the connection between stress and focus. Okay, so the simplest way to think about this is that you've got two parts to your brain. One part is the stressed out part, and the other part is the thinking part. So one part of your brain experiences and processes stress, and then you have the thinking part. The thing that is, you know, the thing to remember here is that when the stress part turns on, it turns off the thinking part of the brain, okay? So when the stress part is on, there is a direct connection to the thinking part of the brain, and the thinking part of your brain turns off. We have all experienced that. For me, like, I don't really love flying. Uh, it certainly beats walking, of course. But, um, you know, when my kids are up in an airplane without me, I'm like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, it's going to crash. I start freaking out. And then the minute they touch down and text me, I'm like, 
oh, I can think through this. The planes are really safe, you know, I, I, they're probably in the safest place they can possibly be. But that kind of thinking is not possible when the stress part of my brain is on because the thinking part of my brain is turned off. So basically, when you are stressed out and thinking, reality feels one way. But when you calm down and you think about it later with the stress part of your brain off, reality feels different. And that's because of this biological connection. Here's a more complicated part of how to understand the same thing that I just said. Stress in large part is re is is uh, involves your adrenal glands, which are little glands that sit on top of your kidneys. Stress makes your adrenal glands release hormones. Those stress hormones travel back up to the brain and they affect a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is way deep down in the brain. How does it affect your hippocampus? It beats it up. The hippocampus shrinks and becomes smaller. And here's another bit of information. So you've got your stress hormones going back to your brain where your hippocampus is. Your hippocampus shrinks. Basically what's happening during that shrinkage period is that the genes that are expressed in your hippocampus change with enough stress. So even after the stress turns off, the hippocampus doesn't work right again. It's not your old hippocampus, it's your new shrunken hippocampus. And it responds differently to things. So that's why people respond differently to chronic stress over time as opposed to one quick blip of stress. Again, it's a biological change in your brain the stress hormones over time, if they are happening often enough, shrink up your hippocampus and you have this new thing there, this new hippocampus, which doesn't respond like the old one did. And that is a problem because many people with ADHD are under a lot of chronic stress. But wait, there's some good news here too, which is that there are things that you can do that can help with your brain. It disrupts the process in this slide. So things that you can do, exercise. Exercise is not just good for your heart and body, it is fantastic for your brain. And if you all need some extra, um, you know, foot on your butt to get out the door and do whatever you do for exercise, remember this, that it releases um, hormones and other chemicals that really help your brain. IGF is um, something that stands for insulin-like growth factor, but IGF works for me. And um, hang on, I thought I'd turn this off. Um, Jesus Christ. Okay, sorry. Um, it grows the uh, cells that were shrunk in stress and um, it helps with memory. So when you exercise, you're counteracting some of these things that, um, uh, are, uh, are your county counteracting with the IGF, some of the stress hormones. And there's this other one called BDNF brain derived neurotropic factor, which again, I'm happy to say BDNF, it grows your brain and makes more connections. It improves learning and memory. Other things that help party or at least being social so being social releases oxytocin oxytocin reduces anxiety again it blocks those stress hormones and the effects on your brain it releases serotonin serotonin is our biggest one that's implicated in depression we know that in depression um you know if we can get people to be more social the amount of stress goes down and the amount of depression goes down so I'm going to pivot here. I'm going to talk a little bit about different ways you can use the biology in order to gain focus and discipline and self-confidence for ADHD. I wrote a book with my husband, Ben, who's a psychiatrist, and Peter Johnson, who is my kid's karate teacher. And um, what I can say 
I said, after uh, hearing a lot of karate uh, classes, et cetera, um, it began to dawn on me that some of the same things that athletes learn are very, very applicable for ADHD. And again, I'm going to tie that in with the biology. So hang on tight here. Um, we talk about why coaching ADHD. Some of you are coaches. The concept behind coaching is that athletes want to win games, but they need skills and determination to do so. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, going to be coaching my daughter's sixth grade basketball team right after I finish talking today. And I'm just going to, you know, we're working on skills, we're working on skills. An ADHD -er can employ athletic skills just like athletes do to win at whatever they want. And the key part of this is when you talk either to kids or adults, they don't go like, oh my God, you want me to see a psychologist? I hate psychologists. They go like, oh yeah, I'm on a basketball team. My, I have coaching. I don't freak out when people tell me what to do. Here are some of the things that sports can help with ADHD. So, you know, th these are applicable to sports and applicable to ADHD as well. To set goals, to push outside your comfort zone, to give it your all, keep your eye on the ball, look for ways to improve, listen to your coach, and if you lose the game, don't get depressed. Find out a way to win the next one. It's also important that we learn how to celebrate the wins. The general concept is to help your brain prioritize one thing over other things more of the time. So if you're a coach for sports, you want to get your athletes to prioritize what they're doing on the court or wherever they are on the field and not be focused on the people in the stands, for example. So how do, how do athletic coaches do this? They give their uh, trainees clarity, be, clarity about what to do and why you're doing it. They try to spark confidence and interest and excitement about the goal. We try to try to make sure there are no emotional issues interfering with goal setting. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. We want our athletes to have the right nutrition, right? Steph Curry has an, oh, you guys are on the East Coast. Steph Curry is our warrior, but I'm sure everyone's heard of them, him. Um, so he's got a nutrition coach. It's important to sleep well. And it's important that what we're asking our ADHDers or athletic trainees to do is the right level of difficulty. Not too easy, not too hard. The greatest athletes try to achieve a flow state and trying to achieve a flow state has not only been talked about in the athletic circles, but also has been trickling down to the business, uh, you know, sort of business techniques and how to get the most out of your employees. Um, the athletes who are in a flow state are the athletes who are like so in control, they can do outrageous things. They can, you know, there's skateboarders who have jumped over the Great Wall of China, surfing a 30 foot wave, all these different things. And there has been a lot of interest from many different areas as to how the athletes maintain such focus when they're doing their tricks or, you know, tasks or whatever you want to call them. A flow state is characterized by clear goals, knowing what the out outcome should be a loss of feeling of self-consciousness and a lack of awareness of your body. So they feel like they're outside themselves when they're doing these amazing things. There is direct and immediate feedback, winning or losing. You know, you don't know later, you know instantly. There's a sense of personal control, like you can do anything. The activity has to be personally rewarding to you and the right level of difficulty, not too easy and not too hard. And the activity has to be pretty interesting and absorbing for you. you. You really are only aware of what you're doing. Along with that, a lot of people have a distorted sense of time. Time seems to slow down when these great athletes are doing their um, events. There are the same neurochemicals that we were talking about in ADHD seem to be amped up in the flow state too. So dopamine becomes really important when you're an athlete who's trying to do, learn new things. 
In addition to what we talked about earlier, it helps you learn new patterns. So that way, when you learn something, the dopamine in your system primes you to look for the next one. You're looking for the pattern. Information flows along what the root a little bit easier and it's stored in a, a chunk. And so when, when the chunk is started, immediately things become natural. You're better able to predict things from one small piece of information. And again, our old friend norepinephrine, we increase arousal and keeps our attention locked on target. Many other chemicals are involved in flow. I'm gonna go through the parts of flow that the athletes use, and we're gonna talk about how to apply them for ADHD. So again, part of our flow was uh, clear goals. So clear goals that define immediate success. We need to know what we are doing and why we're doing it. So when an adhd -er sets goals, the goals need to keep the adhd -er in the present and not in the future. So setting goals is best, what are we gonna do right now? What is our goal for the short term, for the immediate future? The future is where anxiety can creep up. In the present, you're not anxious about something that may or may not happen. So in ADHD, we want to set small achievable goals that prioritize clarity. So clarity is what tells people how to turn on the attention. We also need an immediate feedback. We need a very small gap between input and output to tell us what we're doing and how to do it better. Again, this keeps us in the present. Otherwise, you start thinking about other times, like what happened when I did that and it didn't work out. In terms of the application to ADHD, when kids or adults are getting assessed and getting feedback, it's really important to do that daily. Sometimes it can be formal, sometimes it can be not so formal. So like, wow, I really, I really admired how you sat still for dinner. I mean, you don't need to do anything formal. I really assigned, I really admired how you listened in the meeting and asked appropriate questions. So you can give as frequent feedback as you possibly can. The ratio of feedback should be three positives to every one negative. That seems to keep people going. Unfortunately, with ADHDers, they seem to hear more like 30 negatives for every positive. Another characteristic about flow is a sense of personal control. The athlete who is in a flow state feels like he can control his destiny. He can't miss. Uh, Steph Curry, my favorite basketball player, has talked about how sometimes he feels like the, the bucket is like three, three yards wide. You know, you, you feel like you can do it. You have totally 100% decided to do it. The application to ADHD is that spending time getting a person to own the goal is a great investment of time. So you may have to see things from your kid's perspective, from your spouse's perspective, from your partner's perspective, but unless the person who is doing the task really 100% buys into it, you're gonna have a whole lot of trouble getting them to have the best focus. So one way to think about it is to ask the person if they are playing to win or playing not to lose or choosing not to play or playing only for fun. I'll tell you what I mean by this, which is that in any situation, you might bring different attitudes to what you're doing. So there are times when you play to win. You want to give it your all. You want to get the A plus on the test. You want to get the best score in the uh, sales ever. Um, you want to, you know, outshoot your target. That's what playing to win is. There are times when you're just playing not to lose. You just want to get to the end of the season. You just want to get to the end of the month. You just want to get to the end of the semester. You don't really want to get the A pluses, but you don't want to flunk either. Sometimes you only play for fun. You only do things because you're interested. I'm taking a ceramics class. My object there is not to become the world's best ceramicist. My object is to just have fun with it, and that's okay. And then finally, in any situation, you might decide you don't want to do it. You might be choosing not to play. Helping the person you're talking, you know, your ADHD or kind of trying to figure out where they are 
is really helpful because the ADHD -er brings a different level of focus and commitment to the different quarters here on this slide. And the important thing is that the ADHD -er is okay with where they are and can identify where they are. It's okay to just play only for fun, but not if you're telling everyone, including yourself, that you're playing to win. We talked about the right degree of difficulty. So we need to have something that's not too hard and not too easy, because if a challenge for someone is too great, you get fear and other negative emotions on this slide, fear, fatigue, exhaustion, anxiety, panic, breakdown, burnout, all those negative emotions. We learned earlier in the talk that they turn off the focus part of your brain. So that is clear that it needs to be not too hard, but also when people are trying to do things that are too easy, they get bored and your brain doesn't focus there either. So the right place seems to be kind of in the lower area of the growth and learning zone. You wanna to try to take where you're comfortable and improve it by 4%. So you wanna improve 4% and then another 4% and then another 4%. So the idea is to focus the coaching in an area where somebody's not bored, but also not totally in anxiety and panic mode and do that over and over again. I talk about your personal growth zone versus your stress zone. You wanna be in the personal growth zone and enlarge that little by little rather than go into the stress zone. To have flow, you need to understand that growth mindset. You know, you, you have to believe you're gonna do okay, but you need to be able to tolerate failure. Athletes have a saying, it's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. And that totally applies to ADHD. We talk about failure versus defeat. So I can't do it versus I can't do it yet. I can't do it means I can't, you know, I'm closing my mind to it. I can't do it yet says that with enough energy and time, yes, you can do it. Um. An important thing about flow and focus is that it can't be on all the time. So after starting to learn something, like you can't train all the time as an athlete, you have to kind of take your mind off the problem. Relaxation causes nitric oxide to flood your brain. It tells your stress hormones to go down, tells your dopamine and endorphins to rise. So the application to ADHD means that after you're studying, do something different or after you work, Go for dinner and a movie. Do anything that's funny. Do something that's easy. Or do something that is equally hard, but maybe different. So an athlete might start working on their shooting instead of their defense. Something that's different that keeps your brain from doing the same old circuits over and over again. Same thing with ADHD. It's important to know what keeps flow from turning on. Ambivalence is huge. So I talk to my, my patients all the time about whether they're ambivalent about what they're doing. Ambivalent literally means having different things pull you in different directions. So I sort of wanna get my work done, but I sort of wanna play video games. I sort of wanna take out the trash, but I sort of wanna just lay in my bed and somebody else will take it out, that'll be okay. So that's a big part of procrastination, which is obviously a big part of ADHD. If you can understand ambivalence, then it generally helps the procrastination. Another negative thinking trap is I hate my teacher, I hate my boss, or they hate me, so I won't do the work. That one happens all the time. That is something that keeps the flow state from turning on. It keeps, keeps focus from turning on. So also, you know, there's people who say no all the time. They just say no, 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 no. They call it oppositional defiance disorder. I don't particularly love that, but, you know, then I gave birth to somebody who says no all the time. So one of the things we talk about there is saying no because. No because why? If you think about it and you can't give me a because, you may want to rethink your no. And then, of course, the I can't. Anything that has your negative emotions keeps focus from turning on. Um, there are focusing techniques. So athletic trainers will say, focus your eyes or eyes on the ball, 
which is kind of like visualization in ADHD. You have to be able to see success. Focus your mind is basically translating into eliminating mental distractions. So especially electronics have to turn off. You want to consider activities that are slower pace that help you with focusing your mind. If you're always doing things that are like boom, 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 your mind gets used to working at that pace. You want to think about chess or gardening or something else that is at the pace of the real world. Focus your body includes exercise before a task, breathing exercises, all the things that make your body ready to focus. And focus your spirit, you know, being grateful for the things that you have to do. There are times where I get up and I really don't feel like going to work, but I'm then I think about it, it's like, hey, I'm really happy to have a job and be able to help people. That helps me focus. When things are not working, watch the words. You know, I can't do it versus I can't do it yet. We've talked about on the other slide. Focusing on things that you can do. So internal satisfaction versus external rewards. So internal satisfaction is doing everything that you can do and focusing on that versus the result. So the result might be, you know, if you if your goal is the external reward of getting A's on every test and somebody gives you a hard test that you don't do well on, you might fail. But if you focus on, I'm going to study the hardest I can for every test, you're going to be able to win every time. I'm just going to spend another two minutes or so talking about medications, just that they are um, very helpful for focusing for a lot of people. They're obviously not the only way to go because the beginning part of this whole talk was about some of the non-medication strategies that get your brain ready to focus. But the medicines are all divided into stimulants and non-stimulants. The stimulants are all variations of Ritalin or Adderall. Those are the two major categories and all the stimulants are different iterations of those. They work right away. They work for the day. They are very, caffeine is the world's most common stimulant medicine. It just comes in a cup, not a pill, and it's not as oriented towards focus, more for awake. Um, the major side effects, worse sleep, worse appetite, and worse mood. They are used about 95% of the time because they're overall the most helpful and they do not seem to lead to addiction over time. The non-stimulants are different. They're a little bit more like antidepressants. They can also have side effects. Unlike the stimulants, they're in your system 24 seven, which some people like, some people don't like. I'm also gonna just remind you that taking care of your brain is something you should do. Um, this is um, an area that I had shown you in a previous slide that was involved with um, Focusing. So this is one area of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. It's right behind your eyeballs and it's involved in impulse control. When you play video games, so there was a study that showed that six weeks of an, just six weeks, everyone, of an online role playing game shrunk that, that area of your brain. This is after one or two weeks. So this is the control group on the top where, um, you know, there's basically no changes in the three top pictures because they're not doing anything all week and they come back and they get their picture taken. And then in the two week video game, um, the picture all the way to the left looks like the normals. After one week of playing a violent video game, the brain changes. And then when they stop playing the game, um, uh, for two weeks, then, uh, sorry, when they stop playing the game after two weeks, no, I'm sorry. On the bottom level here, this one is that the first picture is that it's the normal people. And then one week is after not playing the video game for a week. So the brain looks different. And after two weeks, um, the brain isn't quite as different, but it's still not anything looking like the controls with this one. Um, again, on top, this is a control group. They just would come in every week, do their normal stuff and have their picture taken. On the bottom, the first week looks like the control group. The second week is after one week of playing a violent video game. And then the second week, they stop playing the video games and your brain starts to come back to normal here. 
Also remember that alcohol is not good for your brain too either. So moderation and everything. And that's what I had to say. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing the screen and get back on here. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of questions and comments in the chat. Um, uh, I'm just going to go through these things real quick. Um, uh, yeah, so there will be slides available um, in the, um, I think the Bergen County uh, website has slides of previous talks. So my, my slides will be there as well. Um, the sources for the video games, I think they're in the slides. If you have any questions, then you can um, uh, get on my website, which is sarahshayette.com, and I'll answer questions through there. Um, have I seen ADHD kids do well by moving up a grade if they seem bored in class? Well, yes, that can help anybody or having the teacher give them uh, some uh, supplemental or alternative work um, uh, in that, you know, again, it has to be the right level of difficulty. However, if the ADHD or doesn't know how to buckle down and get the work done, then moving the grade up doesn't help. Um, Sheila W. said something about talking more about understanding ambivalence. Um, ambivalence means when you're kind of pulled in two different directions. Basically, if part of you wants to do something and part of you sort of doesn't want to do that, doesn't care so much, it's harder to sustain your goals. You also are being pulled in different direction. Anybody who's being pulled in two different directions doesn't move forward and do something. When my ADHDers talk about their procrastination, a lot of times they sort of want to get their work done and they sort of see a reason not to get their work done. So if you spend some time in um, thinking about why, um, why it's, you know, asking them to think about why they're getting the work done, you know, taking out the trash was an example I gave. Part of them are like, well, if I don't do it, somebody else will do it. You got to kind of address that before you're going to get somebody to follow their goals. Let's see. I'm not sure what that meant. What about when you need to practice outside the sessions? I'm not sure what that is. Um, um, okay. So I had mentioned um, going somewhere unfamiliar, you know, doing something different can be helpful. It can be helpful in different ways. It can help you, A, not be afraid to do new things. So the fear of new, a fear of doing something differently from how you had done it before turns off the focus part of your brain. So there's that. And doing something different also releases nitric oxide, which helps your brain kind of relax and it helps come out of that fear, that fear cycle. Let's see. I think I'm looking at these simply walking. <laughs> okay. I'm just going through the uh, questions. Okay. I think I, I think I got to the questions, but if there's any more, um, I, you know, I, I, I am happy to answer any other questions if you have any. If we want to do any um, in terms of uh, raising hands or anything, we can do that too. Oh, I got two of you. Go for it, Ellen. Hi. Oh, so you just said something that I don't quite understand. Okay. I don't understand better. Um, you said something about fear um, related to doing something differently uh, yeah. release nitrous oxide and that nitrous oxide will help reduce the fear cycle yeah Is so ba basically you know a lot of people with ADHD they do things their way or they get to believe that that's the only way they can do it how many times have you heard I'm a procrastinator that's the way I do things. Um, 
So it gets to be part of your self-identity. And as a result of that, you can't do things differently, which if you're going to improve any symptoms from ADHD, you have to learn how to do things differently. There's a great deal of fear that people have from changing the way they've done it to a different way. Part of a hack or a di you know, way to teach people to do that is to have them practice doing new things every day. That could be a new thing, just walking home a different way. It could be a new thing, I don't know, hopping on one foot across the dining room. I don't care. It has to be one new thing that you do every day that gets people used to doing new things. On a biological level, what that does is reduce people's fear, anxiety, apprehension about new. Since fear turns your focus off, you're reducing that negative cycle. One of the chemicals involved in that is that, you know, sort of like a nitric oxide is a, a, a brain chemical. It helps you relax in your brain and it helps turn off that fear cycle. So is that related to the amygdala? Yeah, I mean, the amygdala is a part of your brain that helps or that mediates stress. So in uh, the previous slide, I had talked talked about the hippocampus being the part of your brain that's the thinking part of your brain. However, the amygdala is sort of like the anti-hippocampus, and it's not just the amygdala. There's other structures that are included. But basically, we're trying to turn off the stress part of your brain, of which the amygdala is one of the stress parts of your brain. Yeah, Joni, did you have... Sure. Joni, did you have a question? Yeah, somebody had asked, um, does the exercise need to be strenuous to benefit the brain? So uh, like how much exercise and a lot of these kids are saying, a lot of parents say, I can't get my son to do anything. I can't even just walk the dog with me. Mm -hmm. You know, what? Yeah, so I, I'm a big believer in the benefits of exercise for your brain. There's a book called Spark, if any of you need a book about it. Um, but basically, uh you know, I, I define exercise as something that makes you sweaty. Now, I'm also going to say anything is better than nothing. Walking the dogs is better than nothing. Walking the dogs also gets you to do something at the pace of real life, which is helpful for your brain. That's how your brain is meant to be, and it helps your brain focus. So, you know, at the very least, we want to do something but best to do something that makes you sweat or at least elevates your heart rate. I think 110 is a number that comes up, but you know, we take what we can get, right? Right. So even like maybe games, making, you know, playing games outside, red light, green light, or, you know, whatever. Oh stuff. yeah, sure. Getting kids just moving away from the idea of like, sure. Structure. Uh, it's just play. Oh, yeah. uh, no, I mean, for, for younger kids, sure. Like any playground is exercise. Uh, yeah. A little mini rebounder trampoline is exercise. It's also a great break if you're doing the Pomodoro method, you know, where you're doing like 20 minutes on or 10 minutes on, whatever the number of minutes is. The off should be something you're not going to stick with forever. Doing push-ups would fit that definition real good there. Yeah, that's a great point. Not video games. Right. That's not what you do in the off part of Pomodoro. But anything that gets you walking around, you know, do a few burpees, sit ups, jump up, you know, pull ups. I don't care. Um, but anything like that helps you do that or take a little walk outside and look at your garden growing. Thanks. Any other questions? My God, at the stroke of six, <laughs> so on time. Somebody actually asked um, about uh, diet. I read a book, reading about oh. diet on effect on to anxi anxiety, depression, ADHD. What's your take on the importance of diet and the? Oh, I see. I see that people are putting that in. Um, eating something is better than eating nothing. Again, um, your brain is uh, a very metabolically active organ. So pound for pound for pound, your brain uses more energy than other parts of your body. There are more 
pounds of muscle. So as a whole, your muscles take up more of it, but pound for pound, your brain is super metabolically active. It does not work well when you don't have enough food in your body. Um, that's the most important point. So skipping breakfast, skipping lunch, those things are bad for thinking. Um, uh, what you eat, I think is less important, but something that doesn't involve a quick glucose spike is helpful because it gives your brain something to work with for longer. Your brain does use a lot of glucose. I'm not saying going on a sugar-free diet, but something that breaks down a little bit more slowly would be helpful. You had and, talked, um, I know your overall topic was about the correlation between ADHD and anxiety and depression. Uh -huh. And um, I have a teenager and I've dealt with different types of physicians uh -huh. and a lot of them, you know, one will say it's more AD, ADHD or one will say it's more anxiety and depression and think the other person misdiagnosed. It seems like there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms. How does one know how to tell which it is? Oh, many times one does not know and one guesses and one <laughs> tries to ask the person what they think is going on and ask their spouses or you know loved ones, what do you think? Um, so for example, let's take poor motivation. It's a hall hallmark of depression. It's also a hallmark of ADHD. A lot of times, not all the time, but you know, that's, that's it. And feeling low energy, that could be somebody who's inattentive, that could be somebody who's depressed, feeling restless, that could be somebody who's anxious and somebody who is, you know, hyperactive ADHD. So a lot of times it is hard to know. And that's why that circle of focus leading to anxiety and depression and anxiety and depression leading to poor focus was an important slide because you know, a lot of times you're trying to clarify what could be happening and asking the person, you know, where do we want to start? And we got to start somewhere. Some doctors will do medicines for both at once. I do not personally. Uh, I mean, rarely. Um, but I, I pick one and try to medicate that and then or treat that and then pick the other one if that doesn't work or add the other one in if it doesn't work well enough. But that is a really, really, really difficult question that I face in my clinical life every hour, practically. Okay. And you addressed the part that I was wanting was medication. Because yeah. you don't want to just throw lots of medication at one, you know, at somebody and hope that something sticks. So I appreciate what you're saying about trying to address one, seeing what happens, and then yeah, I mean, that's the way I do it. There's no laws on this or anything. Sure. Different doctors do things different way. But I think it's confusing enough when you start a medicine to evaluate how it's working and what the side effects are, you know, more than one at the same time, when you also deal with the variables of daily life. Mm -hmm. you no, know, that's just, that's just really, really tough. So um, I really think that, uh, you know, there's, there's time to do one and then the other, but the idea is to clarify for the person what we're doing and why we're doing it. Thank you. Sure. It seems that the, the loss of appetite um, that goes along with some of the medications is more of a problem probably for kids and adults. I don't think adults would mind it that much. But uh, sign they might see it as a perk. But for it only kids, happens to the ones who don't need it, right? I do. Right. But for the kids, especially especially boys that are looking, yeah. at their, teenage they boys, up and it seems to be a problem. I know I have a couple of clients or kids. The boys don't want to take the medication because they want to be able to eat, and they just don't even right. want to. So what I can say is I said that all stimulant medicines are related to Ritalin or Adderall, but there's a whole bunch of different stimulant medicines out there. They differ in formulation. A lot of times they differ in how the medication is released. So the ones that are released more gradually as, you know, seem to have fewer side effects in general and fewer side effects regarding appetite suppression. So um, you know, talking with your doctor and communicating with them is important, but I mean, yeah, I, teenage boys refuse to take these sometimes because they're trying to get bigger 
that's not the case for teenage girls. All right, so um, I think that, um, you know, uh, I'm happy to continue the discussion with anybody. I have a website, sarahshayette.com, and if you have any questions, obviously, um, uh, nothing that I can give you in regards to specific advice regarding any individual's medical condition, but if you have any other questions, I'm happy to catch you on my website. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me and en enjoy Chad. They have wonderful resources. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Really.